You've been so gracious with me as we work through connecting Old Testament with the New Testament, helping us develop a greater lens into how the Gospels were proclaimed in advance through the Old Testament. You have allowed me to push through theology a little quicker by helping me focus on the extra reading and preparation. Thank you for that, church. As we look at one of the most beloved messages by Jesus, where Jesus literally turned religion upside down, we see a little of Moses here. Remember how last week we discussed the grand narrative, how the Old Testament pronounces Jesus, or we find Jesus scattered all over the Hebrew Bible. In the Beatitudes, we see a mount or a mountain or a mountainside. And it has been suggested, just like Jesus was connected to Abraham in a type of great commission from Genesis, the blessing, the covenant. Jesus, in the next text from today, was ascending and descending a mount, a mountainside, just like Moses now. Another connection. Where do we see this? Matthew 5, 1. Jesus ascends the mount in chapter 8. And in verse 1, Jesus came down from the mount. So he ascends the mount, and then he comes down from the mount. Just a reminder of the Ten Commandments, all these connections into the Old Testament. So amazing. Sometimes we focus on the incredible introduction of our Lord in Matthew 5. The Beatitudes is a preamble to even more great stuff. The Beatitudes is a preamble. And Jesus even taught us how to pray there. And by the way, Gene, the Lord's Prayer this week, teaching the Lord's Prayer, awesome. I heard that from the, awesome, the office this week, all this awesome discussion about the Lord's Prayer. And I could hear it. And how wonderful in our church to have a Bible study. It was great. I had company this week. I so enjoyed it. So looking at the teaching between chapters 5 and 8, I just want to read some of it out. We focus on the Beatitudes, the most beautiful thing that we read and we focus on so often. But if your Bibles are here or you have them at home, think about the rest from chapter 5 right through to 8. And I'll just give you the headings. Salt and light, the fulfillment of the law, murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, eye for eye, love for enemies, prayer, giving to the needy, fasting, treasures in heaven, do not worry, ask, seek, knock, the narrow and wide gates, true and false prophets, true and false disciples, the wise and foolish builders, all that between the Beatitudes right through the whole sermon, Jesus' sermon. So wonderful. So this is one beautiful sermon using the word sermon in our modern day. It's thought in our theological studies, particularly through a commentary by Thompson, Matthew is painting Jesus as the new Moses, the deliverer and teacher of God's people. Throughout the many messages we read in this area, the salvation Jesus promises and the behavior he demands in this discourse are grounded in his sovereignty as the new Moses. But a major difference as the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus was ensuring he was connecting with all people, although, although those of Jewish descent were being honored and given an enormous opportunity to become fully free. Just as Moses' words in Deuteronomy speaks to generations after the escape from Egypt, so Jesus speaks to future generations of his followers. The small group of Jesus' disciples we see in the first of chapter 5, the crowds and those who read Matthew's gospel are confronted with the same offer of a divine blessing. What an incredible connection. 
And I pray you are seeing the grand narrative, Old Testament and New Testament, all scripture entwined and connected, despite the naysayers out there who say our Bible is a ragtag book of stories. When you really study God's word, it is divine without question. Rereading and reading your Bibles. It will come together by study, but also by the empowerment of the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I was reminded of things I have done years gone by. Maybe some of you have experienced this little thing, or I call it a, a demo, a trick, whatever you want to say. Mm, Lord, this has been a tough week. Where do I go? Here it is. Come in here and listen to this. Not a good one. How about this one? Well, that's not so good either. And I've actually done that, and maybe some of you have done that as well, but there is a better way. Although once in a while, I've got lucky with those verses. If I can suggest... Focus on your passage. Visualize the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself, right there beside you reading. Because he is. How often do we look up and speak to the clouds? And that's okay. I do that too. But remember, he's all right here. All within distance. Right here. It's hard to fathom that. But it's so true. Simply say, Jesus, show me, help me to understand. Where might I use these words today in my life or to help in the life of someone else? I'm enjoying these weekly messages with you. Our journey together, however long that will be, has increased my desire to study more. And I pray your desire is the same to know more about our precious Messiah and our Heavenly Father, His Holy Spirit, the triune God we love. How we as a church can be better students of God's Word by learning together. What an awesome, humble, and sometimes difficult journey. But I could not be more excited to wake up each day knowing that I have that job to do. The Bible helps all of us to get through our day. Whatever your calling is, you can make the study of God's word your calling, no matter what the title is in your job description. So today, I want to focus on the New Testament and our Lord Jesus providing hope in an upside-down way. Crazy happy as Jesus is telling us how and where we can find happiness, which equals blessing. Another connecting word from last week, in the strangest of places, in the craziest of places. I could say the Old Testament, but I won't. I just did. It's amazing that our religious leaders of Jesus' day would find those who are poor or poor of spirit suffering in some way as the leaders wanted the oppressed or poor to pray, believing that God would hear a person of poor spirit before their own piety. Certainly true, but isn't it amazing and so upside down that those leading the church had the marginalized pray for them? The reason, selfish reasons only. They wanted a blessing. I find that incredible. Think about it. So you go into our streets and find someone who is down and out. Someone who is homeless. Think of the words that many still use. I used the word hobo for many back, way back then. Somebody with a stick over their shoulder and a bag on the back. Difficult. So you find that person who has nothing but their earthly possessions in that little bag. You go up to that person with your expensive religious attire and all your status in the synagogue and say, would you pray for me? God will listen to you. It's interesting the emotional effect on those working in various ministries dealing 
with the marginalized, who say to the worker who has very good intentions, bless you. One really doesn't know what to say, except it's our pleasure, or no, bless you. I see why Jesus talked this way. As our hurting don't hide in masks, they are sincere. And when they, when they say bless you, it's with a sincere heart. I can tell you that. The supplies that this church provides are street marginalized. The coffee and treats from our generous cash donations, the meat put into the one roof freezer results in a bless you from those who have been labeled with all kinds of awesome names, terrible names. That alone should tell us so much about our Heavenly Father, about the heart and mission of Jesus. As we just consider these verses of hope, the Beatitudes, which ultimately, ultimately becomes the Sermon on the Mount, we head back to last week again with blessing. Should it surprise us that Jesus would rather use bless than sermon? Sermon was not part of the Jesus vocabulary. And the word beatitude is not found in our English Bible either. It does say the joys of heaven or a declaration of blessedness, especially as made by Christ. And that's the best part, as made by Christ. He wants to bless us and finds blessing in even the hardest of times. Crazy happiness. How do we find happiness when we feel horrible? Jesus. So Beatitudes occur regularly in the Old Testament. The Gospels have isolated Beatitudes with Jesus. And that, again, is the best part. The word is most commonly used for declarations of blessedness made by Jesus, right here and on the mount. Many theologians, the theologians and those who dig into the Beatitudes will generally hit the same mark. I like Michael Wilkins from the publishers at Zondervan. He says, the Beatitudes are a radically bold statement of Jesus' intent to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, which will bring true peace and freedom for all who dare to follow him as his disciples. It is through those disciples that his kingdom will bring blessing to all the peoples of the earth. The Beatitudes serve as a sort of preamble to the Sermon on the Mount, but really a memorable treasure for humanity. The Beatitudes provide a clear statement on the principles revolving around the kingdom of heaven and inside the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching a right now theology and a future theology. The kingdom did arrive with Jesus, but we have that phrase often discussed, our already not yet situation. We are so close to kingdom come for the final and last time, when Jesus is declared as our world, or only one world president, our king, our supreme everything. And what a day that will be. So each of Jesus' Beatitudes contain an invitation to those who appear to be unworthy of the kingdom. But each also contains pronouncement of condemnation on those who think themselves to be worthy, but are not. In the first beatitude, Jesus graciously pronounces that the kingdom belongs to those who see themselves as having no spiritual resources worthy of the kingdom. But at the same time, he pronounces condemnation on the religious elite who are full of pride in their religious accomplishments. Indeed, the religiously wealthy must humble themselves before God to recognize that they have no spiritual resources that warrant entrance into the kingdom of God. The Beatitudes are a radically bold statement of Jesus' intent to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, 
which will bring true peace and freedom for all who dare to follow him as his disciples. It is through those disciples that his kingdom will bring blessing to all the peoples of the earth. You know, there's some very interesting Greek and Hebrew interpretations of certain words that I look forward to sharing with you at some point. But combined with some ideas by Dr. Rick Tobias, the catalyst for the Young Street Mission, and helping us with a theology of the poor, the marginalized, and the persecuted. So that is coming. And I look forward to unpacking the Beatitudes and the incredible sermon by Jesus with you soon. But a very special application for me this week was from an anonymous writer who provided an example of praying the Beatitudes. I hadn't heard this before. Praying the Beatitudes. I don't think this person was a doctor of apologetic preaching. Who knows? Maybe he was. But I could tell it was right from the heart. Just like our Lord loved to preach and pray, right from the heart. And I want to pray this with you. And I will send a copy to you today or by Monday, as I'm sure it's something you can keep in your prayer chest or in your Bible or share with our prayer group. But before we pray that, there is a connection that I do want to leave you with. It is so fascinating that there are nine unique Beatitudes and also nine fruits of the Spirit. Do you think this is by chance? I don't think so. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So interesting. So together, let's pray the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Heavenly Father, I want the humility not to be impressed with myself and my accomplishments increase in me. More of you, God, not of me. I am overwhelmed with the sense of my spiritual need. I recognize my true spiritual condition of pride and self-sufficiency, and I am broken over my need to cast myself upon your mercy. Blessed are those who mourn. God, break my heart with what breaks your heart. Let me embrace the true grief of the man of sorrows. I die to unholy grief. Let me receive your comfort in my losses. Wipe away my tears in your tender mercy. Blessed are the meek. My Lord Jesus was meek, lowly, and gentle of heart, not to be confused with weakness. He knew he had all the infinite resources of his Father at his command. Lord, reign in me so that I will be gentle in your strength. I accept all your dealings with me as good. Replace my self-assertiveness and my demanding rights with your long-suffering and humility. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I intensely long for more of you with unquenchable thirst. My spirit and my soul will be completely satisfied only in the living water of your presence. I won't try to satisfy my soul's appetite at the world's table. I taste and see that you are good. I ardently desire you as much as I need food to sustain life. Blessed are the merciful, 
Father of mercies, help me to open my heart to others. Through me, show them the mercy they need, setting off a chain reaction of grace. I choose to forgive in the measure as I have been forgiven because Jesus lives in me with his infinite forgiveness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Wash me with your holiness, holy God. Burn out the impurities with your refining fire. I present my hands and my heart for sweet daily cleansing from the pollution and guilt of sin. Separate the precious from the things in this world that are worthless, insincere, and unholy. Blessed are the peacemakers. Prince of peace, I renounce the spirit of jealousy. I am content with who I am before you. I receive your peace in my heart. I choose to be at peace with everybody in all circumstances. As much as I can, I will make peace where there is a discord. As a peacemaker, I will sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. I am an ambassador of reconciliation. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Righteous one, help me to suffer for the right reason, for your sake, for God-likeness and commitment to you, not for self-pity or petty sensitivity. I will stand strong when opposed for pursuing you, and I will fall deeper into your arms. I am a citizen of another kingdom, and I bow only to your rightful claims on my life. This author was an unknown, and we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.